Hello, scholars. So this this first week of discussion, we got a lot of people talking about anxiety and nerves. So I figured we might as well just deal with that. Um, so here I am today, out in front of beautiful Mount Hope Bay, pretty close to where I live. I probably should be wearing a jacket because it's uh, in the low 40s, but you know, it'll look me. Uh, but if you were one of the uh, overwhelming majority of students this last week that talked about anxiety, I want you to feel, I want you to know right away you're not alone, and you probably know that, partially because everybody responded to you and said some some very similar things, but also because what we know about our culture and pretty much uh, the world culture as far as uh, communication apprehension is, there is a 10-80-10 spectrum. 10% of our culture is perfectly fine talking to people anytime, anywhere, about whatever. I sort of fall into that. I, I imagine you probably thought that based on my background and what I do. Uh, and then we go through this big leap of 80%. And there's uh, about 80% of the people in our culture feel okay with it. Uh, they don't love it necessarily, but they can get through it, right? You can do something, you can push yourself forward, and then afterwards, relieved to be done. And some of us that don't really fear public speaking are also relieved to be done, but for other reasons. And then at the bottom, we've got that other 10%, you know, the folks that it is such a crippling anxiety that it, it keeps them from doing a lot of things that they would like to be able to do. It keeps them from being able to take a class like this, whether in person or online. It keeps them from being able to go to the grocery store sometimes. It keeps them from being able to meet people, to talk to friends and family about the things that matter to them. And that's a tough thing, right? It, it, it's a very difficult thing, and people go to therapy for years out of their lives to do that. Uh, so I, I want to start today with an explanation that I, I can't take that from you. As much as I would love to be able to put together a comprehensive unit, a, 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 some sort of worksheet, a, a module, anything, I, I cannot take that from you, right? And I would love to be able to. And partially it is, like, I don't have a strong enough background in psychology, though there's certainly a large psychological component to, to communication. And part of it is, it's not really a fear that we can cure a lot of. I mean, there's three ways that we in the communication discipline kind of deal with communication apprehension. Glossophobia, if you want a Latin word for it, it means fear of the tongue. And the first is, we embarrass people. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of that method, but I'll give you an example of one university that does it. So out in, out in Washington, my friend Ben Crosby went to school, got his PhD out there, and he says the first speech of the semester they do is a four-minute long impromptu speech. This is for their in-person classes, uh, their online classes. They do things slightly differently, but they still build this in. But for their in-person classes, the first, first speech of the semester is a four-minute impromptu speech in the middle of central campus. You don't know what your topic's going to be until your time comes. They give you a topic and you stand up in front of a crowd of people that you've never seen, don't really know, and you give this presentation. And the, and the thought process behind it is, is interesting. It's that when you go back to the classroom, that more structured environment, it's never going to be as bad as it was in that moment outside there. And they're right. Like, I completely agree with the reasoning. I just I think that they lose probably too many people that first week. And that's a really difficult thing to put people through right away, right? And we want you to enjoy your experience in your in your fundamentals, of, the fundamentals of public speaking course, or your fundamentals of business and professional speaking course. Because honestly, most students will only take the one class in communication their entire time through their two or four or six or eight year run through school. And well, I want you to get something out of it that feels positive and and makes you want to come back and maybe have a little bit more. Uh, the second school of thought is systematic desensitization. And we're going to do a little bit of that this semester. I believe there's some talk about it in the readings. Systematic desensitiza desensitization is if something bothers you, creates anxiety, fear, uh, some sort of trigger, that you go and you do it over and over and over and over again until you figure out how to deal with it. And it can be tough. It can be a little triggering, uh, in all honesty. So for, for example, I don't like roller coasters. They, they move weird. It's not the heights, it's not the speed, it's the movement. The movement freaks me out. Even thinking about it right now it makes me just feel a little jittery, right? But if I wanted to deal with it through systematic desensitization, when Six Flags New England opens up here in about a month and a half, 
and my wife and I would go up and we would ride the roller coasters all day long until I figured out how to adjust my body to deal with that. <clears throat> so we're going to give you some opportunities here this semester to figure out how to deal with it. We're going to do a lot of video posts so you can kind of push a little bit beyond there and figure out how to prepare yourself to do those things. And then we'll have the opportunity to speak with each other in an online capacity through Skype or some other uh, means here soon. And then the third is skills building. Skills building is what you do pretty much, uh, excuse me, what you do for the most part throughout uh, fundamentals courses. It's like building a house. We start with like that that base frame, like concrete. We dig out, we put in concrete, and then we put up timbers, and then they plaster and, and, and molding and insulation. And it's, it's possible that I'm giving this in the wrong order because I'm not a contractor, but you get the idea. Like we start at the bottom and we build things up. And I'm a big fan of that. I'm what you would call a Vygotskian theorist, uh, based on the work of Lev Vygotsky. Lev believed that knowledge was best built and derived and understood when it's built on knowledge that you already understand. So we start with things that you, that you can grasp and then we start building things on top of that rather than giving you the whole thing and hoping that you just succeed. <coughs> and we'll do that by starting this week with getting your topics in order and then we're going to talk about research and we're going to talk about outlining, we're going to talk about presentation skills. We'll keep adding on until we have that sort of large house built up for you. But uh, let's go back to the notion of like what is anxiety, public speaking anxiety, where does it come from? Here's a, a recent poll from the Chapman, uh, Chapman University survey on American fears that the Washington Post published. And you see up there at the top, if you squint in really carefully, I'm sorry, there's a tiny text. Public speaking is up at the top, followed by heights, bugs, snakes, and other animals, drowning, blood and needles, claustrophobia, flying, spiders, zombies, darkness, clowns, and ghosts. Um, and the interesting thing about the bottom nine is that they all have these weird definitive ends. Let's go down to the bottom. Like, so the, the ghost fear is a fear of, of like being clutched, right? something enters your body and takes the life force away and you die. The clown's fear is sort of an abduction fear, like what are they going to do when they get you in that tiny car with, like, with 85 other clowns? <clears throat> and the darkness fear is a fear of the unknown. What's out there? Will it come and take us? Will it hurt us? The zombie's fear, which really wasn't a thing until The Walking Dead started premiering on AMC a few years back. Again, it, it's like somebody, something comes in that takes you and it rips the life force from you. With strangers, again, much like darkness, it's a fear of an unknown. What are they going to do? What will they take from us? Could it be our lives? With flying, it's not so much soaring through the air like a, like a bird. It's that sudden drop that we were about happening, and the plane crashing and us dying in that fire wreck. And claustrophobia is a crushing fear with the life force and breath being pushed out of us. <coughs> Needles and blood, it's a fear of what, what might happen. What's in that needle? Or what happens to our blood if it's taken from us, right? What happens to us? With drowning, I, I guess it's ironic that I'm in front of the, a big oceanic body right now. Drowning, I, it's, again, it's a fear of death, right? Like we lose our lives in that. With bugs and snakes, it's not so much a fear of like the little thing itself. It's what it could do, right? With snakes and spiders and bugs, a lot of them are venomous, right? And they, something latches onto you and your skin becomes necrotic and that, that venom works its way into your heart, seizes everything up. And heights, it's the same as flying, that sudden drop at the end. But public speaking is weirdly different, right? It's not a fear of death. It's only a fear of wanting to die, right? <laughs> but instead, it's a fear of going on. Psychologically speaking, glossophobia, public speaking fear, is the fear is most closely related to the fear of being eaten. And that doesn't mean that like like we shamble up to you like zombies and bite take bites out of you. In in public speaking, in communication acts, we expose a little bit of who we are. We give people a taste of what we care about, who we want to be, what what we want to do with our lives. And the fear is rooted in that when we give someone a taste, maybe they won't want another. That's a tough thing to reconcile, right? Because judgment's everywhere. 
And, and it doesn't matter what the medium is, whether we're, we're standing face to face, whether we're doing this online, whether you're swiping right on Tinder, <laughs> uh, if you've got a farmer's meat account, or, or if you're on Match.com, eHarmony, if you're just sharing things on the discussion board, if you meet someone at a coffee shop, if you stand in front of a large group of people at a political rally, like folks are doing right now at the Iowa caucuses today, we expose ourselves when we communicate with people. And that exposure makes us feel vulnerable. And, you know, we do kind of want people to like us in a lot of situations. So we need to, we need to get a little bit past that. And, and we can do that by developing better positive visualizations and kind of doing some cognitive restructuring. And when we say positive visualizations, we, we're talking about imagery triggers. Like, when we think of what could happen in public speaking, our minds often go to very dark places. Like, everybody's going to laugh at me, or I'm going to drop my note cards, or I'm going to sound stupid. And honestly, I don't think that's unhealthy. But only if you don't completely focus on that. It can be healthy if you think about what you could do to fix that. If you're worried about dropping your note cards, you also should imagine yourself picking them up. If you're worried about belching, you can just imagine... You need to think about, like, okay, well, sorry about that, everyone. We're going to keep going. We might get a laugh out of it, but we're going to move on. And we're more interested in you succeeding and completing than what we are uh, with you messing up earlier in the speech. So we have to restructure some of these cognitive processes. And we have to do it enough so it becomes conscious behavior. Uh, conscious behavior is located in the front of the brain, right? And con unconscious behavior is in the back. And sort of like when we count to 10, like you don't have to think about counting to 10, but if we give you a new way to count, like a different language, you have to put that up in the conscious portion of your brain and really think over and over and over about this to make sure that you're getting it right. And eventually, once you've thought that through enough times, it goes back to the unconscious portion of your brain. So if you want to get over some of these things, you got to spend time thinking about it. you got to spend time practicing it so that it becomes more conscious behavior. So let's run through some of those cues that kind of hit up every once in a while. First of all, I always hear this one. I don't have any strengths as a speaker. But already we're seeing people post up videos and do discussion and complete some tasks with one another. So we're doing something right already. And it might be that you have good uh, hand gestures or you can smile at the right time or good eye contact or diction or whatever it is. But there's something there. And again, Vygotsky and theorists, we're going to build that house up from what you can do and add some things onto it. I'm too nervous to do well. This one kind of popped up a few times. I think one of you said you'd recorded this like 15 times before you felt like it got it right. And that's okay, uh, though we don't need to do it quite that much. Folks, understand that a little bit of nervousness in your presentations can actually be a good thing. Adrenaline is an accelerant. When it goes into our systems, we feel like we feel a lot more from it. Uh, it's similar to, uh, I guess, meth. I, I don't know. I've never done meth, but I mean, we'll, we could talk to our, some of our friends that are maybe really into that. And but it makes you feel more. So if you if you if your hands are shaking a little bit, for you it feels like they're all crazy. And if your voice is quavering, it feels like 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 the physics of sound has suddenly changed. <coughs> but it also is going to make you more likely to use hand gestures, to move around a little bit more. It creates a little bit of eye shine, uh, a little bit of wetness in your eyes, which we mistake for fervor, not for nervousness. And most of those cues, what, uh, what we estimate is that well over 90% of nervous cues are not visible to the audience. We're not really looking for them. What we're looking for is what you have to say and how you're saying it. This one pops up so much, they'll think I'm boring, stupid, articulate. They'll get a taste of who I am, and they won't want any more. And I, I honestly think nothing could be further from the truth in a class like this. We already saw people giving you hopeful messages of, we'll work on this together and whatnot. Uh, in classes like this, everybody really wants everybody else to do well. It's because we're empathetic viewers of media. And what I mean by that is we take on some of the emotional content of what we view. For example, think of one of your favorite movies, books, or television shows, the character that you really empathize with. When, they, when something good happens to them, it makes you feel good. When something embarrassing happens to them, your cheeks flush up a little bit, right? 
where you get that same feeling in the pit of your stomach you think they're having, when something bad happens to them, you get upset and angry, right? Uh, and I don't think I'm spoiling anything from this last year, but like, my wife and I went and saw the latest Avengers movie, and we sat there in the seats at the end of the movie and cried along with the rest of the audience because we were upset about what was happening. Uh, I don't have anything important to say. Man, you just you hear people say that in conversation all the time. And sometimes maybe it's true, but for this speech, it will not. Because we are going to work our way up to it. We're going to spend like the next month building things into our first presentation so that when you get there, you aren't going in cold. You're going in with that fully formed structure, ready to set up and be successful. And finally, it has to be perfect. Oh my goodness, it does not. It really, it does not have to be perfect. I want you to share what you can. But you're not going to give a perfect speech. And that's perfectly okay, because it doesn't exist. I've never given one. I never will. Dr. Martha, Martin Luther King never gave one. And two gave some pretty good speeches. Like If you have not watched and listened to the Mountaintop speech or the I Have a Dream speech, do so. Like You learn a lot about public speaking, and it just kind of makes you feel good about where we're at. Before our speeches, folks, relax. Get rid of any excess energy. If you are a person that normally goes and jogs, go jog that day. If you go to the gym, go to the gym that day. If you play video games, video game that day. Don't change your routine for what we're doing. And certainly have some food. I've seen five people pass out in my speaking classrooms, right? And I'm worried about it maybe happening online because I'm not there to take care of it. But I've seen five people pass out in my classrooms. And all five of them... <sighs> All five of them. None of them have had anything to eat that day. And for a couple of them, it had been 24 hours since a meal. They just got so wrapped up in perfection and making sure, like, like being worried about this thing, that they forgot to take care of themselves. Get a good night's sleep. Uh, have some water with you. And it's okay, no matter the medium, like to have that thing ready to go. Uh, don't apologize when you when you when you start speaking to us or when you send me an email or really to, at the start of almost any conversation or any communication act. Don't apologize. When you start with an apology, it gives the audience a reason to doubt you. And don't do that to yourself. We can do better. Be sure and breathe. We know that long, slow, deep breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth, are scientifically proven to slow your heart rate. There's a reason they teach athletes and musicians to breathe correctly. And we can do the same thing in public speaking. Afterwards, again, breathe. You're done. Relax. Don't apologize to us there either. Because, man, like we're going to start looking for things you did wrong if you start offering up apologies. Really, the only time you should apologize in a speech is if it's a speech of apology or you did something colossally terrible and you need to make sure that we understand you did it. Don't make mountains out of molehills, though. And then take some feedback and answer some questions that we may have. And here are the most important things we can do in preparation. Number one, practice. When you give a presentation, no matter the circumstances, it's best if it's not the first time you've ever done it. Plain and simple. Number two, practice. Here's how I practice. I start at the end. I always practice my conclusion first. And there's a reason for that. Because I want to be sure I'm headed towards something that I'm comfortable with. And once I feel comfortable with the conclusion, then I add another main point and another main point. And finally, the last thing I practice is the introduction. We see so many people do this thing where they start with the introduction. Every time they mess up, they start over. And the only thing you guarantee there is that you'll have a really solid introduction, and then everything else after that kind of gets murky. Terminal credibility. The credibility you have at the end of the speech is probably more, much more important than initial credibility. The credibility you have at the beginning of the speech. And we'll talk about credibility more later down the, down the road here this semester. Finally, practice. There is a such thing as overdoing it. We don't want to memorize speech that creates a weird linear path that you can't deviate from. You want to be able to make adjustments for your audience, but practice. Right? Feel comfortable with what you want to say. Be ready to make adjustments based on what you see. All right, let's look at today, uh, this week's tasks. Let me minimize my PowerPoint here. So here we are at the front page. I'm going to throw an extra credit video into the how-to videos. Uh, so 
be sure and look for that. And then we're going to go to week three. And it'll look slightly different because at the top of week three, there will be this video, but I don't obviously have that video done to put that in for you. And we've got three things for you to do this week. We'll have a discussion, we've got a reading, and then a, a, a follow-up assignment on that. Let me put those two things together so that they make more sense for you. And the reading deals with performance anxiety, so that's something that we're all talking about right now. And then the assignment asks you to come up with some ways to deal with that. Uh, there's an overview for the first presentation, and then a short, short, short assignment asking you to find a topic for it, which is already sort of provided for you. And then we're going to do a discussion. I think this semester we're going to do a weird sort of discussion where it doesn't necessarily feel like it's part of business and professional speaking. I just want to talk about some normal things in a lot of our discussions because that's going to give us a chance to get some of that systematic desensitization done and to get used to online interactions, like what will be important for you. And I think this is great because this is how we're going to be interacting with people in the workplace over the next several decades. We're going to be posting videos. We're going to be doing online discussion. We're going to be doing FaceTime chats. We're going to be talking on Facebook. Um, weirdly, like, like online video games are becoming the new golf for business outings. Like people are, are interacting this way. So our discussion this week will be about music, since a lot of you brought it up this last week. So our initial, uh, initial dis discussion post will be due Thursday evening, as it says there in the discussion. You'll need to post uh, a video of song from YouTube, a song that you like, from a band you like, it could be a news video, it could just be the music itself, that's perfectly fine. And then a follow-up video where you explain uh, a bit about that video. And all that's embedded there in the discussion for you to look at. Um, by Sunday, you'll need to have in a couple of the uh, replies, but let's keep in mind, you know, all of you that took the syllabus quiz understand that just doing the bare minimum is not gonna get you the full credit for this class. So if you go and do the simple two replies, please don't expect 100%. That's completing the bare minimum. It's not going above, it's not going beyond, it's not exceeding expectations for the assignment. Uh, and then Sunday evening, we'll also have a couple of these assignments too. You, know, you can take a look at those on your own. Uh, as per usual, please let me know what questions you have. Hit me up uh, via email or in the general questions thread. I hope all of you have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you online very soon.